I'm going to welcome on to the stage our penultimate speaker. And talking about code as advocacy, please welcome and give them a fantastic energy in the room to Dr. Courtney Ziegler. How is it going? Um, first off, I want to say thank you for inviting me to Afrotech Fest. I had an amazing time. Um, I flew in on Tuesday. As you can tell, I have an accent, so everybody has told me since I've been here, <laughs> as soon as I opened my mouth. Um, I had a great time um, in exploring London. I actually lived here when I was like maybe 21 um, and had no cares in the world. Am I not? Is it like this? Why? Would, would that make a difference? Oh, it, oh okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when I was about 21, uh, I moved to Brixton and I worked at a, a pub, I think the Crown, or it's called the Crown, and there's a hostel above, a, a hostel above and a bar below. Um, and it was fun, but I couldn't afford it, so I moved back home and I was an immigrant, so I, uh, I had the immigrant experience. Um, and I really wish that I had stayed because I actually like really enjoy being in the city. So again, thank you for inviting me, and I'm really excited to give this talk today. So um, I changed the title, forgive me. I was not ready about that. So um, I changed the title of my talk. Sorry. Um, and I really want to talk about, uh, about finding purpose. I'm at a really particular interval, like a moment in my life where um, I've gotten to do a lot of awesome things in terms of like the academy um, and arts um, and now in technology. And I'm almost feeling like I'm having a, a professional life crisis. <laughs> where I'm like, I don't know what to like, you know, I'm, I'm really excited with the work that I'm doing, but I'm consistently trying to figure out my place in the tech space. Um, I'm really glad to be here again because I've gotten to sit in on um, a lot of my colleagues' talks, and they mentioned the kind of being like the only one in the space, um, one of or one of few. Um, and I feel like that at home in the States is the same thing. Um, technology industry, I live actually in Silicon Valley, um, and so there are a handful of us that live out there and are doing amazing things in the tech world, um, but we are marginalized in so many ways. Um, and I'm marginalized in a lot of ways. I'm gonna out myself, I'm transgender. And so that uh, kind of adds another level of my existence in Silicon Valley. So I'm having this moment where I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Um, but I always want to kind of return to finding my purpose. And so today I wanna talk about, like kind of close this out on my journey and my story um, and how we can all kind of like find our purpose in this space as black folks. So I'm Dr. Courtney Ziegler. I am the head of research and design at Zam Labs. Um, I'm a California native. I am a dog father, dog dad. That's my lovely dog, Doe. I love her so much. <laughs> um, yes, I don't know if anybody in here are dog people, but um, she has literally saved my life and changed my life in so many ways. Um, I call myself a social inventor, a creative entrepreneur, and I say that I've been building and making awesome things for at least 23 years of my life. Um, probably even more, but let's say that that's safe. So Zam Labs, what is that? So Zam Labs stands for Ziegler and Michael Labs. I have a co-founder, Tiffany Michael, um, awesome, awesome black woman, really brilliant. She's been a software engineer for about 15 years. Um, helped to found a company called Dev Bootcamp. I'm not sure they had that in the UK, but they eventually got bought by Kaplan. Um, so it was really exciting to work with a black woman who's actually like been on the founding team um, and had made an exit in the tech space. Um, I'm not an engineer, though I do code. Uh, I do more of the business side. Um, so partnering with someone who is an engineer has been really, really awesome, um, being able to learn from her and how to like build a successful company and sell it um, and her being able to learn from me about how to kind of do a lot of operations um, and business things like that. This is actually, thank you so much better. <laughs> um, uh, some of the things we build are Appalachian. Um, thank you for the shout out. I appreciate that before. Um, this is actually a screenshot. We were just in the Chicago Tribune, which is a major newspaper in the United States. Um, and I'm not sure how it is here uh, to get 
uh, featured in newspapers, but getting featured in kind of tech magazines is a little bit quicker and faster. It's like online, it's media. Um, this took quite some time for us, and we are actually on the front page, which is amazing. Um, I can't really say that I know of any software that's been built by black folks recently that has made the front page of a major newspaper in the United States. So, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, thank you. Um, we were also just featured in Time. Um, we, were, we were featured in Essence. We were featured in so many, so many magazines um, with the launch of Appalachian. And I want to talk more about Appalachian as I go through this talk. Um, so awesome. I have this thing. <laughs> so why does this talk matter? Um, again, I think we talk a lot about in the tech space about like how to build a business, how to code from nothing, how to um, build an MVP. Um, but it's never really about how to sustain yourself, how not to die, <laughs> I'm about defining what matters in this space. Um, and again, that's where I'm really at in my professional journey really kind of like taking it day by day to really find out like, is this, am I doing something that matters for myself? Not only for like the world that I live in and the technology that I'm building, but am I doing this for myself? Do I feel good? Um, can I continue doing this every day? And again, those are things that I don't think that we talk about enough in the tech space. So for me, this talk matters to close out a conference where we had an amazing weekend, um, amazing food, and I met so many people. I did meet like three people today, so that was really cool. Um, and really focus on self-care. So what is purpose? That seems so, so deep, but not really, right? <laughs> um, I kind of define purpose as a force that drives us to create, to make change, and to exist. That's my definition. It drives us to create, to make change, and to exist. And I think those, those words are, are themselves are very powerful. Um, but when we think about like why we do the things we do, um, or if we do think about the things that do, why we do the things we do, um, these are the, the, the words that came up in my mind, right? Something that's gonna make an impact, something that's gonna create a shift, something that's like moving by force. Um, that's what I consider purpose is. Um, we don't talk enough about purpose in, in tech space or professional spaces in general, um, but it really is why we do anything, why we do anything in our life, but also why we do anything in our jobs or, or what we're making um, or what we're selling. Um, it's the core, right? And then you get to your how and what. But finding your purpose is the center of not only your world, but exactly everything that you're building. And I've come to start to kind of understand my purpose in a number of kind of like monumental, monumental ways, very, sorry, a little tongue tied, um, very meaningful ways of, of, of that I've had in my life, certain experiences that have really kind of shown me what my purpose is. Um, and one of those things is being born and raised in Compton, and I'm not sure, I actually wore a Compton hat when I landed, and someone immediately asked me about Kendrick Lamar, and was like, and I was like, so I was like, great. There's like a reference, <laughs> to, you know, like there are like um, people who have done amazing things from the city that I'm from that I can now travel, and people are like, I know that's where you're from, right? I know about that, in, about that city. So I'm born and raised in Compton, 1980s baby. Um, dude, I got, I call myself an elder millennial, which is like, you know, we're cool, but like my knees hurt a lot, <laughs> like, jeez. Um, <laughs> but I am an 80s baby. Um, and growing up in, in Compton um, in the late 80s, early to late 80s, um, early 90s, um, really shaped who I am as a person. It was a moment in the, I'll um, give you a little bit of history of the city and the states. Um, it, it was a moment in which kind of like black folks were moving from the south um, to the west and settled in, Compton used to be an all-white suburb. Um, actually, George Bush was born and raised there too, which is like really weird that we were both from Compton. Um, and so it used to be this really predominantly white suburb. Um, black folks moved in the early 80s. Um, it was like kind of a second wave of a migration to the West Coast um, and settled in Los Angeles. And Compton is one of the cities. There's also like uh, South Los Angeles and Watts. I'm not sure if you all have heard of these cities, 
Um, but Nipsey Rust, Nip, Nipsey, Nipsey Russell, Nipsey Hustle was just murdered um, in Los Angeles, and that that's kind of close to where I'm from. Um, so you have these narratives of of that space of being like kind of like surrounded and perpetrated by gang violence and poverty um, and things like that, which has really shaped who I am. But it was in that moment of growing up in Compton that uh, I got my first computer when I was a teenager. Um, And it looked exactly like that. Is this good? Probably use. This is not my computer. It's smart. Um, I don't know how old everybody is in this room, <laughs> but I want to say that some of you in your 30s like me. Um, this was exactly my first computer. It was a gateway. Um, my grandmother bought it with her credit card, and if she was alive today, she would still tell me that she was paying for it. Um, so it was like one of those things. Like we were really poor, um, and my grandmother like uh, was a retired postal worker, um, and I was in a program called Upward Bound, and it like helped what we call inner city in the states uh, kids have a kind of pipeline to college. Um, and it was the first time that I had used uh, the internet, actually, which was uh, in the in the nineties. 90, which the internet came around like 94, right? Uh, so it was like maybe a few years after the internet was like on PCs, and so I begged my grandmother to get me one, um, and my life changed ever since. I've been addicted to the internet and to the possibility of being able to build amazing things with a computer, being able to create communities with a computer, um, being able to meet tons of people, build my life. I really found a, a strong purpose um, in my life by getting this computer, um, which was hell of expensive, so. Um, and that's a quote from my grandmother. Um, in the United States, some of the states kind of have state models, and she's from Missouri. Um, and they say it's the show me state, so she would always like say if I wanted something or, or something was happening, like, I'm from the show me state, you're gonna have to show me. Like literally what, like, if you want something, show me what it is. Um, but if you want to be something, you have to show me what that is too. And so I, I love this quote from my grandmother because um, when I did get my computer um, and went online, uh, like AOL, and you get to get those discs um, and access the internet and talk to folks online, um, my grandmother really encouraged it um, and was really about like, well, show me what you're doing. Like literally she would say this saying all the time. Um, and it has really stuck with me because I, not only take it as the meaning like, okay, that's really cool, there's a state motto that my grandma like talks, but it also like, I think it's deeper than that, <laughs> um, at least for me, I've come to kind of appreciate that like, from, from what I see this as, it's like, for me to, pr to be seen and respected and accepted as any type of person that I want to be, I have to be authentic. Um, and that authenticity is important to show everybody who I am. Um, and so getting that computer and having my grandmother say over and over and over, um, use that computer to show me who you are was a really pivotal moment in my life where I discovered my purpose um, and have stuck with it ever since. Um, one of the things that I did before uh, working in the technology industry was I was an artist. Um, I still am. I was just talking with a friend earlier um, that I think that I still am an artist, but not as much as I want to be. Um, primarily because I'm focused on entrepreneurship now and it's really hard to build a, a company um, from the ground up. Um, but one of my first films is called Still Black, A Portrait of Black Trans Men. Um, it continues to be the only uh, feature length documentary uh, on black trans men um, that's ever been made, which is amazing. Um, I made that when I was 26 years old, um, when I was completing my PhD. Um, and I, I bring this, this up because moving from the computer saved my life as a teenager and really showing me how to show myself as an authentic person, um, then shifting into being like, oh wait, I can use other kind of tools that are tech-based to tell my story, um, to show who I am to everybody. And so I did that with Still Black. I've also made, uh, that's me, 3 t um, um, and it's a painting of my grandmother that I did. I also paint. but. I really use film as a way to show people who I am um, and tell my story. Um, and I think that that's something I definitely want to return to. But 
had I had not, <laughs> really, seriously, had I had not gotten that first computer, I don't think I ever would have like figured out that I can use, uh, have something tangible to create and tell my story outside of writing. Um, you can go to stillblackfilm.org and download the film or purchase it for download and share it. Um, I highly encourage you to. Um, we still screen it around the world, we as an I. Um, it still shows, it just showed, I feel like, in India a few months ago. Um, it showed in Jamaica a few months before that. Um, and it's over 10 years old, so still black film. So after kind of like having this creative moment, um, I stayed in school for a long time making films. Um, eventually uh, went to get a master's degree. I don't know why, I was encouraged to do it. Um, a professor uh, really thought that I could kind of create something new and, and contribute to like um, different kind of fields of knowledge. And so they encouraged me to get a master's degree. Um, and so I did and again, start to fall in love with research. Even though I identify as a nerd um, and love to read and love to like kind of always, I'm like, I'm a Sagittarius, I'm always like, what else can I learn? What else is out there? There's so much. Um, but being in school really gave me kind of a platform to, to, to indulge my nerdiness um, because I'm not sure how many of you are in graduate school, that's all you do is study and research and hopefully contribute something um, that will get you a job in the future, um, something, but something that will also expand the field of the work that you're doing. Um, I love Zora Neale Hurston. Um, she's one of my uh, folks that I definitely look up to because I, I find myself a lot in her. Um, someone that's very radical, someone that's very vocal, someone who didn't you know, really give a F about like, what people think, a really smart, um, an ethnographer, um, and somebody who lived a life that showed people who they were. Um, and so I'm just gonna read this quote to you. Research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. Um, and I love that quote because that's how I feel about like the world and research, um, being able to, to find what is the why of something um, is super fascinating to me. And it, and it gives me purpose because again, I'm like always like wanting to know more and more and more. Um, so I went to school. Um, that was me the day that I got my PhD, I got hooded. I was actually the first graduate of my entire department, um, which is amazing. Um, so you can clap if you want to. But <laughs> um, and um, I got my PhD in African American studies. Uh, I, sh I shortened it to black studies um, at Northwestern University in the United States. And uh, it was a tough journey for me. Um, being not only who I am out and publicly trans, um, it was in a primarily black American space that wasn't very welcoming to uh, gender and sexuality, unfortunately. Um, which is amazing because we're they, they're doctors, right? <laughs> like they're like people who supposedly like you know have unlimited knowledge or, or like are unlimited uh, thirst to to find different ways of being um, and more open-minded. And that really wasn't my experience. Um, but that negative experience I had really moved me to find my purpose because um, I wasn't feeling the best in seminars. I turned back to the internet um, and I used my time outside of school to write a blog. And it actually became an award-winning blog um, when blogging was popular. Um, this was WordPress. I wish I was here. Uh, I was I I was so excited to meet Mike. Thank you guys for having Mike here. Uh, I was sitting here watching. And I was like, Oh my God! I didn't know the co-founder of WordPress was black. Um, so I went up to him. I was like, Oh my God! And then he was just like, Okay. <laughs> and I was like, You don't understand. Like I remember the infamous like five-minute install, which was not five minutes ever. It's never been five minutes, Mike. But um, that was my first. It, I started a blogger, um, Blogspot. I think it's blogger now. And then. Um, went to WordPress, and this was at a moment where, yeah, the early the early version of WordPress where you had to um, still kind of hack it together, <laughs> um, bring in like other kind of like tools. Um, now, God, the internet moves so fast. Jeez, uh, yes, I was 25 years old. Um, Black Academic went on to become multiple award winning, uh, which was amazing, and it was just me in my apartment in rural Illinois, like hating my life because I was in a horrible. Um, I mean, I loved 
I'm glad I finished my PhD, but it was a hard time. And so I really turned to the internet to find my purpose. Um, and for me, it is now, it, it, it created an archive of my work. Um, sometimes I go back and look at it and I'm like, wow, I don't, even, I don't even think that, which is great. I don't think that way anymore. Um, but it was really kind of a, a, a pivotal point in my career as a person, um, but also kind of catapulting me into the technology industry, um, which I wasn't anticipating to be. I was going to be a professor. And I ended up being a professor for a year before I quit that to start a company. Um, so this is a quote from me. Uh, I do a lot of writing as well, um, talking about not only purpose, but my, my journey in, as an artist and as an academic, but also as someone in the technology space. Um, this is an article I, I had written about recently about, I don't remember, no, it was about resistance, the idea of resistance and what that means to me as a out black queer person in tech um, and how just my physical being um, and my audacity to exist is resistance. Um, so this is a, a section of my essay, and I say, in an industry rife with racially exclusionary practices, I remain convinced, oh, that's so much better. I remain convinced that it is on the fringes, the sites that others refuse to touch, that I am able to thrive. Um, and what I mean by that is, it's exactly what everybody has been talking about, which I mentioned earlier, that like being the only one or one of few, um, in a space that is so actually rich with our history and our contributions, like, but then we're like marginalized. Um, in some ways, it's a gift and a curse because it's in those marginal marginals, the margins that we can like actually that we create things like this that we like need to find each other that we have to uh, force ourselves to connect with one another um, because there's no we, there's no way we could survive, right? Um, so that's kind of how I've been finding my purpose in the tech space, is like recognizing that um, we've always been here, we've always been contributors, and it's so awesome. I was sitting in on a, the Steam workshop earlier, making uh, wearable tech, and I'm actually moving into wearable tech um, really soon, and so I was really inspired by uh, kind of the fashion aspect of it. And someone raised their hand, and they were like, well, you know, like uh, uh, black folks have always created technologies with our clothes, um, to make it, they were giving an example that uh, seeing someone far away, um, some folks have created clothing to enhance how we see their bodies. Prior, you know, years, 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 years before we're like just starting this wearable tech thing. And that shit fast, and I'm sorry, I apologize, that fascinates me so much. Like just the ability to like recognize that black folks have always been contributing to everything in the world in so many important ways in a space where we're marginalized and told that we, that we don't. Um, and that we're not, and that our contributions are kind of, and not even just marginalized, but erased most of the times. Um, that again, that it is, it is, it is in those spaces that everybody doesn't else, that nobody else wants to touch. That we create amazing community. I'm gonna slow down a little so I don't stumble. Whew. So, my creativity, my education, those are two things. My grandmother. Um, those are three things that have helped me find my purpose and then kind of ushered me into the technology space. Um, about, what is it, 2019? Um, about six years ago, I founded an organization called TransHack. Um, and it continues to be, it was the first organization in the tech industry that was specifically focus on transgender people um, and creating technology to sustain our lives. Um, and so I was living in the Bay Area. I uh, had finished my PhD. Life sucked. I could not pay my rent. Um, I couldn't get a job. Um, the department that I graduated from, like I said, even though they were uh, it, scholars, brilliant people, um, they weren't necessarily really excited to have someone who's openly trans in their department. But now, the joke is on them, um, because I am their first graduate, I'll forever, they forever have that legacy of a black queer person is like their first graduate. So they always have to recognize me, which is really awesome. Um, exactly, so fuck Northwestern. <laughs> no, um, so being, being in that moment where I was like literally losing everything that I had ever known, I was in school until I finished my PhD at 29. So I was in school all the way up until 29 years old. 
And then all of a sudden my whole world collapsed because I wanted to live my authentic truth, who I am and have no shame. Um, it was hard. <laughs> uh, I became the statistic that I would study, right? The number of the trans folks who can't get a job and um, are, I've experienced severe anti-trans discrimination in the professional space. Professional space. Um, so I was living in the Bay Area, seeing how kind of uh, technology is like usurping Prim primarily all of the Bay Area. So Silicon Valley has now extended from Palo Alto, which is about an hour away from Oakland where I live, but now it's in Oakland. Um, so now we're competing with tech workers who move from out of state. Um, Hyper gentrification, um, black folks. Uh, California has about 3%. <laughs> it's one of the largest states in the union, has about 3% black folks. Um, now it has gone to maybe about 2% because of the, the technology industry. Um, and so being in that space and, and, and figuring out, oh my God, what's happening to me? How do I not lose my home? Um, but how do I also uh, fit in this kind of like new tech space that's evolving? Um, so I came in, I went to a hackathon, Tribeca Hacks, as a filmmaker hackathon. Um, and I noticed that it wasn't very queer friendly. Um, and as a filmmaker myself, they, nobody was taking me seriously. Um, and someone who actually knows how to code, um, I, w I still wasn't being respected in the space by my colleagues who were primarily white, um, folk, white young folks. Um, and so that gave me the idea to start TransHack. And it started as a hackathon. I got support from, I was a nobody in tech, like I didn't know anybody. Like I, it was just like me emailing people, going to websites and being like, hey, I think you're like, maybe may support trans people or that you've done something that like shows that you kind of are open-minded are really, it was like really the start of the diversity in tech conversations that are happening in the States. Um, so I did my research, because I had that skill, and was able to make the right connections with folks, um, and launched TransHack in 2013. Um, super successful, we, we ended up uh, having multiple events um, at Harvard, MIT. Um, Yeah, um, and so kind of really, really blew up. So funny, actually. There's now a TransHack UK that just happened. It's not us. Um, again, an another example of black folks getting marginalized in the tech space. Um, white trans women um, went and made a TransHack last year. I just was told about it like maybe two weeks ago. Um, and which, you know, is it's it's problematic, <laughs> um, but it's also like wow to be able to create something that everybody wants to replicate, and they're like, how did you do that? Um, and I still have major organizations that reach out to me like, how how were you able to kind of create a space where folks of all kind of backgrounds, because it wasn't just trans people coming together, made actual working technology that exists to this day. Um, there are apps. There's a uh, app where it helps trans people find bathrooms in the United States. Um, that Yelp just took the, they now built on top of that. So now when you access Yelp, you'll find gender neutral bathrooms because of an app that came out of TransAct. So it's been so amazing to be a part of an organization that has created technology that is being used by a number of organizations that are improving the lives of all of us, um, which is really freaking cool. Um, this was us at Harvard. Uh, these are a mixture of people of different identities. That's me when I didn't have locks. Um, that was our first trans hack. We had a trans hack flag. And that's an awful photo, but uh, Janet Mock was our first guest speaker. Um, she created a hashtag. You guys watch Pose, right? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, so so um, Janet was our first uh, speaker at trans hack, and it was virtual. So that's Google Hangouts, and she was um, Google Hanging Out <laughs> um, virtually. And I was asking uh, Janet questions. You can kind of see me in the corner there. And the reason why Janet Mock was the first guest we ever had because she created a hashtag on Twitter called Girls Like Us. Um, and even though it's not an app or anything and she doesn't code, um, it was something that really created community to help other people find their purpose online because um, that's how trans people kind of connect. The internet has really shifted our lives in so many ways. Um, and so it was really important for me um, as a trans masculine person to really um, create a space for trans feminine and trans women people 
um, to hear from someone that's doing amazing work. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to like ha to have had the opportunity to have Jaden Moss at a Trans Hack event. So Trans Hack went on. We kind of like wrapped up in 2017. Uh, I uh, was the founder. I am the founder and wanted to do other things. Um, and so met my co-founder at a, at this Trans Hack event in Chicago, where I met my co-founder, um, and she was like. I was actually a professor at this moment, and she was like, do you want to quit your job that I had just got, just got, and the only reason I got that job was because of Transact was popular, um, and I was invited to teach at uh, where I got my master's degree at, um, a one course, and it was like the first time I was actually invited to teach at a school, and I taught, um, and I was like, oh my God, I finally, I'm gonna become a professor, and they're like, and I met this woman, and she's like, do you wanna start a company? And I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Screw this professor stuff. Um, so we, we started a company. Um, one of the things that we do at our company is, uh, in addition to building live video software, we are really focused, we are black folks, black, everybody on our team is black. Um, and so for us, it's really important to continue not only creating technology for marginalized folks, but also technology that's, that's focused on black folks, um, because we have access and we have the resources um, and in the space of Silicon Valley, there's so many, like where I live, there's so many delivery apps. I can get all kinds of stuff delivered to my house. I can get somebody to clean my house. I can get somebody to wash my dog, wash and watch <laughs> my dog. I can get somebody to, but they have cuddle apps. There's so many things, right? Ridiculousness. Um, one of the things we notice in this space, there, there's not a lot of, and maybe that's shifting, hopefully, um, but where we live, there, there's not a lot of kind of attention of using technology for something that can make a social impact for black folks. Um, and so that's super fascinating to me, um, and I wish it would change. Um, so I'm hoping that projects like Appalachian are, are things that kind of influence that. So Appalachian, what is that? Um, in 2017, a lot of conversations were starting to have about money bail. I think it's very similar here in the UK, right? Someone has to grant someone bail if they're charged with a crime so they can go on with their lives and not have their lives ruined. Um, before their court date. Uh, in the United States, black people are disproportionately affected. They're, they're the highest incarceration rate. Um, more black people are incarcerated than actually are not incarcerated in the United States. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> and so um, tons of people, thousands of people, I think I want to say like 90,000 people a day languish in jails because they can't pay bail. And bail could be a dollar or a pound. Um, and it sometimes ranges up to $60,000 or, or $70,000. And they're not, they're nonviolent crimes. Um, and you know, most of the time people are charged. They're not even, they don't eventually get charged with the crime. I mean, they don't eventually, what's the word? Convicted, exactly, thank you. They don't get convicted of the crime, though they may be charged. Um, and so bail has ruined, it ruins people's lives. Um, and so the conversations of bail are really kind of, really coming up into the mainstream. Um, and I love Twitter. I'm gonna ask you to follow me after this. <laughs> I love Twitter. And I tweeted, uh, what if this existed? Um, and people were like, hell yeah, I'd support that. And that tweet is super viral. I know it's stopped at 1721 likes, but um, it's, it still actually gets retweeted. <laughs> and there's still engagement with that. Um, and so I put that tweet up and folks were like, I would support that and I would sign up. And we're like, oh yeah, word, okay, let's do it. So about four months from that, we launched Abolition. And it's a play on the word abolition, because uh, I'm a prison abolitionist. I, we don't need prisons in the world, I believe. Um, I think there's a whole other way of being we can imagine. Um, but also kind of like using an app to get people out of jail, so Abolition. Um, we launched, uh, November 2017, uh, like the end of November 2017, and then we went to April 2018. So that was like five months. Um, and in that five months that we were uh, uh, around, we wanted to have 200 users sign up. That was like, we were like, let's do an MVP, let's see if we can get 200 people to sign up. We had 200 people in about an hour as soon as we went live. Um, we ended up with 5,000 users. Um, which is kind of crazy uh, for anybody to build, in, it, anybody who builds software um, and trying to get people to use it <laughs> is, is really hard. Um, 
And so our early adopters were in the thousands. I think that is my computer, and I'm sorry. Um, I just broke my computer. Um, so yeah, we launched November 13th. We had 8,000 signups by April, um, $130,000, what is that, like maybe 140,000 pounds here. Um, and that's just spare change, it's a spare change app. So people link their bank, bank of cards, they go and shop. If I spend um, a pound 50, uh, 50, 50 P goes uh, to bailing someone out. And our app automatically collects it. It's a, sp it's a roundup app, they already exist. I don't know if you all use Robinhood or Digit, um, the technology has already existed, but in Silicon Valley, it's to like you, you use it to like for your stocks, for savings, for investment. So we were like, how can we use that model <laughs> um, and and use it to get people out of jail? So we did that. Um, we had we bailed out over forty people, ranging from again a dollar to sixty thousand dollar, and then we actually started winning awards. Um, Within two months, we, we were number seven in the top 10 most innovative companies in the world uh, by Fast Company, which was, yeah. Black folks. <laughs> um, and that was amazing. Um, so we were listed with like Starbucks and Patagonia and like, you know, big name companies where they have, to, and we're completely bootstrapped. Um, this was a project of love. Um, we invested our own time, money, engineers, effort, design into it. Um, and so it's doing something amazing for black folks. Uh, so we, to April 8, 2018, um, we extended what we could offer our MVP users. So we had to start over from scratch and rebuild the app. Um, so we took, I wanna say like maybe five months off to like go back to the drawing board and like rebuild it so we can like um, work with more banks. Um, so we came back in August, maybe sep no, September 2018. Um, and March, it was an exact year, and in an exact year, we raised, uh, I think we're on $350,000 at this point. Um, we still have thousands of users, way too many, <laughs> um, and every month, about $25,000 is collected from our users automatically, um, getting people out of jail, black Americans, so. Really, really cool, Appalachian. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to sign up. We're actually um, right now in development to offer access to UK banks um, and hopefully working with uh, UK organizations here and figuring out how we can pay bail for people here as well. You guys remember this meme? No? <laughs> it's one of my favorite. Rihanna uses it in her Fenty Beauty thing. She's so good, she, yeah, okay. <laughs> She's so smart. Oh, I can't. Oh, I want to. I want to meet Rihanna so much as a business person. Like she is. She's so smart. Um. So she uses social media women in particular. Um. Do you know there's a black woman who does ASMR videos, and she used to pick. Yeah, Rihanna used her too. Damn. I'm sorry. I'm just like hella excited about Rihanna. Anyways, <laughs> back to purpose. This was a meme about a woman who was selling houses. And her house, she was like, she'll walk with a glass of wine and be like, I know you want to buy a house. And she'll throw it down. It's like, I'll show you how to buy a house. <laughs> I think it's so, and she, she became a viral sensation. So um, I'm going to show you how to discover your purpose in the things that you build. And the first one is to remember that you do provide value. Um, I appreciate you listening to me and kind of going over my, my background and my history. Um, it took me a while to really feel it in myself that I provide value because even though I'm kind of a workaholic and I know that my, I mean, I believe that my work has an impact, um, but I also know that me as a person, <laughs> as just, just, just Courtney, um, is, is a valuable asset. Um, and that's something that we should all remember and recognize working in this tech space where we're not celebrated as humans most of the time. Uh, our, our humanity isn't seen all the time in the ways that we want it to be. So remember you provide value. Um, Find your community. Uh, I had to, in some ways, build mine um, via TransHack and things like that. Um, so there's, uh, I think still at this moment, um, trans representation in the tech space is still something that is still new, I think, in a lot of ways um, for a lot of folks to, to really kind of grasp. When we talk about gender in tech, we talk about cisgender women. So we talk about, we gotta make you know diverse gender. It's never people like me. Um, 
it's always like this idea of like we need more more people who identify as women. So find your community. It's so important. If I did not build my own and attend things like this, um, I would not be building anything. Uh, I would probably still be unemployed, depressed about my life, and have lost everything if I did not know my value um, and find people who support me and believe in me, um, even if I had to make it. Uh, remain open to growth. I cannot stress that enough. <laughs> um, I am a person that believes, uh, I think that I'm a smart person. I know that I, the smartest thing that I know about myself is that I don't know everything, um, and that recognizing that and being aware of that is the only way that I'm only gonna grow as a person. Um, I'm always like, I, I appreciate that I'm an open-minded person, but there's always room for growing. I try to grow every day. I try to push myself to learn something new, um, whether that is uh, something about business or somebody else's work, um, or even like uh, I'm taking up sign language now. Someone, I, the, the Afrotech uh, comic book uh, saw that today, and that was really inspiring to me. That that's amazing. By the way, that's amazing. Good job, Afrotech. <laughs> like, um, it's so awesome because there's like. Uh, a variety, a diversity of children that are featured in this in this comic book, right? Kids that are hard of hearing, um, kids that have ADHD, kids that are trans, uh, and that is amazing. I'm not necessarily a comic book person, um, but again, that was a moment of me of growing. I was like, oh my god, there's somebody who's doing something that's amazing. That's center that's centering um, young black queer kids. Um, I'm assuming just in the way that the world works, that doesn't really happen a lot in, in comics. Um, and then there was a moment where there's like, the book was teaching me sign language, and I was like, oh my god, this is uh, amazing. I feel like everything is like, um, has these important moments in life that definitely connect. Um, and so I'm always open to, to growing. Um, and as my grandma would say, uh, show yourself, tell your story. Um, I preach this a lot. Not only because I'm a trained researcher and I've, that's what I do, I have to learn how to cite people, um, but because I've seen my work marginalized and erased so many times, um, and I think that will happen to, I think that happens to us all in so many ways as black folks, um, not only in the tech space or whatever world we're operating in, that if you don't tell your story, people, it's, people will literally say it didn't happen. Like if you were not out there, like literally, I tell my story all the time, and I get a lot of flack for it because you know I c it could be annoying. Um, but I know if I don't say it, um, somebody else will say that I didn't do it or that um, it didn't happen. Um, and I think that happens to all of us again. And so it's always important to tell your story and talk about the work that you're doing, um, tweet about it, um, post it online. You're creating this archive. The internet lives forever. It's important for us to like tell our stories that way. Um, and never feel bad about it <laughs> at all. Um, help others. That is something that I, uh, I think I've always done. Um, I'm learning to do that more in the technology industry. Um, again, for the repeated theme of, of that black folks kind of need this like support structure. Um, and so I love it when folks reach out to me for support because I, again, I started TransHack just by emailing people and being like, can you help me out? You don't know me, but I think you, I think we should know each other. Um, I think you should help me out. And so I'm always open to helping others. It's the only way I think I'm gonna grow and, and move myself forward as a person, um, but also being able to, to pass on skills to other folks is super important. Um, I just have a couple of asks before I end. Um, one of my asks is to, we're not in the UK yet, but if you could shout out, or if you want to donate, you can go to Appalachian.us. We are a web application, because we want to be ex as accessible to people. Um, we, we operate in the United States and Canada. Again, we're uh, in development with UK banks. Um, you can tweet us um, and s tell people to sign up, or say, hey, Appalachian, or something. That would be really great, uh, word of mouth has been our main resource of how we've kind of been super successful. Uh, we have, we actually have millions of dollars and millions of pounds uh, in earned media. Um, again, which is what I was talking about earlier about like being on the cover of the Tribune uh, and making time and all these like important things. Um, and follow me on Twitter. I love to tweet. Um, I engage with folks all the time on Twitter. It takes up too much of my time actually. My girlfriend hates me. 
but <laughs> um, I I love Twitter, so I think I've been on it for like my Twitter anniversary was uh, I was an early adopter, so it's been around twelve years the entire time. Um, thank you. Yay. Say something. Um, is there time for questions? I don't have to, but I know that there isn't. But I know that other people have questions. So I will take one question if anybody has one. Um, but if not, if not, then I'll just get off the stage. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Just before.